Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show. Today is Tuesday, February 2nd, Groundhog Day. And uh, the day after the Iowa caucuses, when um, Donald Trump stuck his head out and realized it was going to be six more weeks of campaigning. Um, <laughs> joining me on the line, Andrew Malcolm, veteran political observer at Investors.com slash Andrew Malcolm, the prince of Twitter at A.H. Malcolm. Uh, you should be following him. If you're not, then you're then you're not elegant. Uh, you're 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 you're. I don't know what's what's a typical what's a typical Donald Trump uh, put down. You're a loser. You're a loser. You're a loser. You're a loser <laughs> if you are not following Don, uh, <laughs> not following Andrew Malcolm. You follow Donald Trump too. Actually, I'm I'm one of Donald Trump's followers on Twitter, and he's back on Twitter. He had a 15 hour hiatus, Andrew, and then and then he's back. I wonder why that would be. I'm huh. I'm curious as to why that was too. You know, actually, he gave a short speech last night after coming in second, um, which means that kinda, he was kind of gracious. Actually, it was actually a gracious speech. Um, joked around that, that he that he loved Iowa so much that he was thinking about buying a farm, which says to me, you know, really easy remake of Green Acres coming up. You know, I'm okay with that. <laughs> um, he, he'd be great in the Eddie Albert role. I'm just saying, you know. Um, <laughs> But but it was a gracious speech, and he thanked the people of Iowa, and he, uh, you know, he he uh, said nice things about the other Republican candidates. Uh, special no, shout not out. Not really. Well, he did. <laughs> he he said they they were all great candidates, and he gave a special shout out to um, Mike Huckabee, who left the race last night. <laughs> um, I actually was pretty impressed by one thing in particular. It was very short. He only spoke for about two minutes. Andrew. Yeah. Uh, it, it uh, those I I en enjoy watching those speeches most of the time uh, to see what they reveal about the candidate. The goal of those speeches, of course, is to provide a mini biography, which Trump doesn't think anybody needs, and uh, a capsule summary of their best talking points. Uh, because they will have a national audience of people, many of whom do not watch the daily news, but do tune in for election results. Uh, so Trump's speech, I thought, was good. I mean, he didn't really say, I lost. He said there were 16 or 17 candidates when we started, and, uh, and I came in second, and we're honored. Uh, he didn't really address the fact that he was leading in the last 13 polls uh, uh, of Iowa uh, and um, blew it. Uh, but uh, it was Trump, it was typical Trump, except that um, he, as you said, was, was, was gracious, sounded, he sounded surprisingly gracious for a Trump speech. The other speeches, I thought, were really very interesting. Rubio's, Rubio I, I was, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, taking sides. I'm trying to observe the best and the worst of how these people do what they do, because I used to be doing that sometimes, and I'm, and I'm intrigued by the strategy of it all. And Rubio was very smart. First of all, he came out... Um, he he had played down expectations, so he was the real winner. He came in third, but he was the real winner because he way outperformed uh, the polls that had showed him in 15% or 17%, and he came in at 23 point something, right behind Trump. Uh, and uh, uh, so he came out in prime time before the East Coast went to bed so he got the biggest audience of people watching these things um he gave a 15 minute speech that was very aspirational uh that slipped in his biography which is you know it's a wonderful story uh i think it's better than cruises but it's similar in the sense that he's the son of cuban immigrants a uh, bartender and a hotel maid who ma assembled lighting fixtures and they traveled around the country to find work and and uh, 10 years 
into their experience as new Americans. They had bought their own house uh, and so on. And using his, Rubio using his story as an American story and how it's threatened by seven terrible years of, of Democrat rule with, with Obama and continued threat by Hillary. Uh, at 15 minutes, then you'll notice his family came out with him, but his wife took them off the screen. So they weren't there, the kids, uh, which is very smart, the kids weren't there wiggling and, and uh, distracting people watching. They had Rubio and his banner behind him. And then when the camera pulled back, there's the pretty family, and they hugged and walked off. Cruz came out late, and uh, he has uh, uh, an, em- an emphatic, sometimes or often strident manner of speaking. But he came out late. He was obviously very happy. He appeared to be reading the speech. Rubio didn't have a teleprompter, but uh, um, Cruz seemed to be reading his speech, using his finger to follow along. He thanked everybody, which is typical to thank everybody, but you don't usually go one by one with everybody on the stage and hug them, including family members and and his father that he's been telling the story about uh, uh, abandoning the family and Cruz saying how he admired him all of his life. And then Cruz going into his standard attack on um, his own party as well as the other party. Uh, and talking about driving the Washington cartel people finally, once and for all, into the Potomac and out into the sea, never to be seen again. <laughs> I mean, it was, right. it was uh, there was some anger there, folks. Uh, and then he quit after 40 minutes. Yeah, I mean, that was that was so long. <laughs> That Fox even, cut away. Even Fox, even Fox News cut away. Yeah, it was yeah. amazing. I, you know, I'm thinking to myself, it's you know, you you really deserve a victory lap here. I mean, he really did because he worked his butt off in Iowa. He he won. People were people were uh, predicting that he wasn't he would maybe come in second, but he wasn't going to take it. And 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 I I get all that, but. He did all that, plus his stump speech, plus some other stuff. And, I mean, at twenty at the 25-minute mark, I, actually, I went actually back to check when I had first updated the live blog to say that he was starting out. And I, I, I'd waited a couple minutes because I wanted to say what he said right off the bat. And I'd realized that he got at least 25 minutes by that point in time. I'm thinking, who does a 25-minute victory speech? <laughs> yeah, I Newt really... Gingrich maybe, and I don't even think Newt Gingrich's was that long. Which which one did he win? Did he win South Carolina last year? He won yes, one a lot, or four, and, uh, four four years ago. Four years ago, excuse me, right? And he his went on a little long, but I don't think it went on half as long as as Cruz's. Who does a forty minute victory speech, Andrew? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, and and. Uh, First of all, he did it late. Second, it was too long. And and third, I, you couldn't call it gracious. You could call it pleased, but I wouldn't I wouldn't call it uh uh gracious. No. Um, so so uh, I think that was uh, that was a missed opportunity as like you said. I I certainly understand that he would um, want to take a victory lap. Uh, he uh, he earned it and he According to the polls, he came from behind, uh, and you know he probably wanted to enjoy the moment because there's as many evangelicals in New Hampshire as there are bluebirds at this time of year. Yeah, this is um, the, the the New Hampshire's. I want to get to New Hampshire in a minute, but I mean, last night was was a good night for Ted Cruz. I mean, certainly the long speech isn't going to hurt him, but <laughs> it was. It just went on forever, and when Fox News has to cut away from your victory speech because they've been recording Hillary Clinton the whole time, and now Bernie Sanders is getting up and talking. <laughs> I, I mean, I was actually surprised they stuck with it as long. And you know, a good a good politician, and Ted Cruz is definitely a good politician. I'm not. I don't want to say this by saying that for some reason I'm, I'm arguing that he's not a good politician. But really, honestly, a good politician can sense where his audience is. 
and make adjustments. And it was clear halfway through that speech that he was losing the audience. I mean, they were cheering, but the cheering was going from, yeah, to, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 It was, I mean, I could, I could hear it in, you know, in, in the, in the responses that just, it started sounding like Congress during a state of the union speech. <laughs> That's immediately yeah. what I thought of. It was like, this is like the the endless round of, of of standing ovations in a State of the Union speech. They don't really mean it, but they know that they've got to do it. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. So. Uh, oh wait a minute! Wait a uh, minute! I've got to I've got to say this though. T. Rand does have a point in the chat room, which is this: these two commenting on Cruz not being pithy is rich. <laughs> yeah! 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 We're gonna get to that. <laughs> We'll get to that. We'll get to that in a minute. Well, the show is scheduled from four to five, folks. Right, yeah, we got we got time to fill here. You know, it's uh, we're we're not we're not one event among many uh, on the dais here. And I, I mean, look, okay, so let's take a look at the let's take a look at the at the win itself. Um, I actually didn't think it was that horrible of a night for for Donald Trump. He he missed his RCP polling average by about 4 points, which is about the margin of error that you get in this type of polling roughly. I mean it's it's you know it's certainly within that ballpark. Ted Cruz outperformed his polling by about 3 and a half points, which is again within the margin of error. The only one who really performed outside of that normal sort of margin of error thing was Marco Rubio. He got 6 and a half points higher than where he'd been polling. And, you know, a second place finish for Donald Trump isn't the end of the world in Iowa. He's not necessarily an Iowa candidate anyway. Um, and whatever mistakes he made, he's got plenty of time and resources to correct. So I was a little surprised, Andrew, maybe I'm off the mark here and I'm, I want to, I'm going to get your opinion on this. I was very surprised this morning to see all of these Trump fevers over. He's been exposed. Donald Trump is a loser. It's like, you know, he certainly, I have my issues about the Donald Trump candidacy, but, you know, a number two in Iowa for a guy who had pretty much no ground organization is still a number two in Iowa. And he got about the same number of delegates as um, Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio did. I mean, they all finished within five points of each other. I, I, yeah. I don't see that as a as a huge loss for, for Donald <laughs> Trump. Uh, well... I think it, it it looks maybe worse than it was um, because uh, he has such a humility shortage, uh, <laughs> and and the world looks and goes, ah, okay, fine. How do you like those apples? But um, what it does do, and the same thing for uh, Hillary Clinton, is it punctures their balloon of inevitability trump was feeding that um and i think trying to get some endorsements to make it look like he had become inevitable and the train was leaving the station and you better get on board uh but when you lose and i don't i'll leave it to you about the margin of error but uh 28 to 24, uh, I wouldn't call close. And um, No, so, in that sense, it's not close. But I'm saying, in, in regard to his polling numbers, it wasn't that far off. And, and, oh, no, no, right. Yeah. So, uh, if you're, But if, like you said, if you're playing the expectations game, uh, Rubio uh, won by <clears throat> being yes. third. Yes, yes. So, uh, uh, but uh, now he... He uh, he seems mortal, and uh, for a regular person, uh, you know, if you're a regular politician and you get spanked, as say Obama was in 2010 with the midterms, or um, 2014 with the midterms, uh, or any of these other disappointments that Obama's had, you come out and even if you're faking it, you. You take it in the ear, and you say, "Well, you know, we uh, we were taught a lesson last night, and I want Americans to know 
I learned it. I learned that lesson, and we're going to move on. Obama doesn't do that. It's him. It's just not in his nature. He can't apologize. He can't admit error. Uh, and uh, Trump sort of did it, uh, not in a standard political way, but he does nothing in a standard political way. That's part of his uh, appeal to his to his folks. But I think a lot of people who were coming to think, okay, well, it's going to be Trump as the nominee, um, go now went, uh, oh, I see. He's got his 25, 26% of hardcore folks, uh, but he doesn't seem to expand beyond it. Mm-hmm. He, was try- he was trying to, to, to with this inevitability momentum, but... It didn't, you know, it didn't work. So we'll see what happens. He is way ahead. I think even for Trump, it would be hard to lose what one poll said was a 28-point lead in in New Hampshire. Well, our Real Clear Politics has the average lead there at 22 points. He's 22 points. His, his RCP average is 22 points higher than his nearest competitor, which is, uh, well, it's a tie, Ted Cruz and uh, John Kasich. But Kasich's pretty much there because of one outlier. Um that had him at twenty percent. Uh, the um, Kasich is is New Hampshire's kind of guy, though. He is. Yeah, he definitely is. But it's also Donald Trump's backyard, and like it or not, I mean, New Hampshire isn't Iowa, and it makes it makes sense that in an independent-driven state like New Hampshire, that Donald Trump's going to make some inroads because people are going to assume that he's the kind of guy who's going to be uh, maybe even. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word here. He's going to be uh, the kind of guy who just wants to get things done. He's going to be an utter pragmatist and leave ideology behind. He basically has been campaigning on that. Is that. You know, he's not a conservative. He's just somebody who gets things done and it's huge and it's elegant and it's the greatest. And you're going to, you're going to win so much. You're going to get tired of winning, you know, that type of thing. That's the type of rhetoric, frankly, that will interest independents in New Hampshire who are very tired of ide- ideological wars. And I know this because I went and interviewed a bunch of them in my book, <laughs> Going Red. Yeah, there isn't there, uh, didn't you do a book, Ed? I did. It's called Going Red, <laughs> the two million voters who will elect the next president, how conservatives can win them. But, I mean, seriously, New Hampshire's in here because um, it's a, it was an interesting swing state, and that was what people were saying. We, we don't want ideology. One guy who is a lifelong Democrat is really looking hard at supporting a Republican because basically he said, you tell me how my kids can deal with student debt uh, and get rid of this, this, huge loan, uh, this huge loan load off their back, and I'll be in your party. And, and, and I kept hearing things like that, not necessarily on that issue, but things like that. Uh, yeah. In New Hampshire, and that's what they're looking for. They're looking for somebody who's just going to cut through the noise and get stuff done. And you know, Tim Allen in Hollywood hey. was even saying that. You know, th- this is don't let him handle immigration because he's a lunatic on immigration. But you know, put him in charge of infrastructure building, and in four years, you're going to solve a lot of these problems. Yeah. Well, it's uh, like uh, that guy Robert. What's his name in New York? Um, uh, he's dead now, but the guy who built all the bridges and everything, uh, I forget his name, um, but uh, was head of the Triborough Authority and the bridge. And Anyway, uh, yeah, yeah, and the uh, the appeal of, of, of getting the trains to run on time, that's something we've seen in history, too. Uh, it, it's, it's simplistic, and it doesn't happen, but uh, people want to believe it. And after a period of such uncertainty and economic and social pain even agony maybe uh i think people are looking for or a lot of people for simple simplistic answers and 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 trump is providing it uh so people who think well now's the time to get a conservative in and and unleash the economy uh are, are kind of stuck when they're asked to show how Trump is, uh, he says he's a free trader, except the 45% tariff on China, that, that might work. Uh, so, I don't know, it's, it, this, Iowa, obviously, the record shows, doesn't, isn't, is not a predictor. It, uh, it has picked uh, 
the Republican nominee uh, only 50 percent of the time since 1972 and 43 percent of the time for Democrats. Uh, uh, and you, if you need evidence, you can ask President Huckabee or President Santorum. So it, it's not something that, uh, that is a guarantee. It's an interesting first step in what has to be, I think, even cynics have to admit, is a rather inspiring process. Uh, tedious, noisy, raucous, crude, rude, brutal, expensive, all of that about the American electoral process. But uh, to see the struggle and the conscientiousness with which millions of Americans approach this uh, uh, nomination and then election process is is really kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, this is... Um... Iowa is really a kind of a cool exercise. It really is. And I, this year is the first year that I can remember, though, that it actually counts. Yes, you pointed that out. I yes. saw that uh, online. Uh, that finally, uh, it's binding, and uh, and it makes sense. And I think Rance Freiba said something like, for every 3.3% of the vote, you get a delegate or something. It's something. Uh, it was yeah, because it's 30 votes. It's 30 um, 30 delegates. Iowa has 30 delegates. And so, yeah, so basically that's a, a pretty, you know, for last time, last time, everybody may remember, uh, uh, on, on, on caucus night, uh, Mitt Romney was proclaimed the winner. And then a couple of weeks later, oops, never mind. No, it was Santorum. Well, that's the democratic party this year, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, uh, because it was non-binding, uh, when they got to Tampa, uh, Iowa's 28 delegates, 22 of them voted for Ron Paul. So the whole <laughs> caucus exercise was a complete waste of time, which is what, <laughs> excuse me, they're trying to get get around this time. And uh, with a turnout of 180,000 plus, you have to say, uh, which is, what, about almost 60,000 more than last time, you have to say that uh, it went very well from an organizational point of view. Uh, and it gave uh, Rubio some some momentum coming out of there uh, of the of the people uh, who who voted uh, using uh, electability as their main criteria uh, by far the largest I think it was forty seven or forty nine percent picked Rubio. Uh, as being the most electable, which is kind of a revealing, uh, which is twice as much as Cruz, kind kind of a revealing uh, uh, insight to uh, people who want to win as much as I do. So let's talk more about about the Democratic side. Now, this is Iowa was a state that Hillary ended up in third place in two thousand eight in a surprise showing by uh, Barack Obama and John Edwards. She fell in, She fell behind both of those guys. This time around, it was supposed to be different. She supposedly learned all the lessons from 2008 and was had designed her campaign to win Iowa. I mean, really, honestly, specifically, they had a plan to win Iowa. Bernie Sanders shows up and takes half of the vote and almost half of the delegates. He ends up like 0.2% behind Hillary in the final count. And they had to flip coins six times in these precincts andrew yeah and how did hillary do on those six ed she won all six isn't that amazing i think I'd like it's to amazing see the video replay on that was it a two-headed coin you know what's her what's her pick for the super bowl this weekend that's what i want to yeah <laughs> well i tweeted a picture of baghdad bob saying what's unusual about winning six coin tosses in a row with no wit living witnesses <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, all of a sudden, the, um, the 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 buildings were struck by lightning and everything burned to the ground. Um, yeah, there was uh, there was a guy on Twitter who said uh, six straight coin tosses. Boy, she ought to get into cattle futures. Oh wait. Oh wait. I like Michael. <laughs> I like Michael Ramirez's take on what the coin looked like too. Oh, with the yeah. Yeah, that was uh, with the nose, the Pinocchio nose that runs right off the dime. Yeah, yeah, yeah like that. I thought I thought he did a nice job with that. Of course, he does a great job on everything. And uh, give me liberty or give me Obamacare is his new book, and you should be buying it. By the way, uh, 
We'll, we'll promote that book, and I won't even hold up my own because that one's pretty awesome. <laughs> In fact, I might have that here. Hang on for a second. Uh, no, I don't have it handy, but I do have a copy of it, and it's around here someplace. Give me Liberty or Give Me Obamacare um, by Michael Ramirez. You can order it right now. Um, but yeah, oh, I mean, by the way, can you order Going Red now? You know, it's funny you should mention that, Andrew. You can actually order Going Red at Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, Amazon, iTunes apparently has it now, and... Um, Google Play, uh, both of those will have the uh, ebook format. Isn't that amazing? Is well, amazing. that's certainly. Uh, uh, I I can't imagine anybody who doesn't want to know how the electoral processes works, uh, especially people who would listen to this show. As pithy as it is, as pithy as this show is, yeah, we're all we're known for our pith. All right, so uh, we'll, we'll come back to the book because I have I have some more information coming up on the book later in the show, and I know you'll all be really raring to hear about this but um uh do you think that this damages hillary's standing do you think that it makes because she's not going to win new hampshire uh she's getting creamed in new hampshire and and bernie sanders obviously comes out of iowa with quite a bit of momentum and quite a bit of credibility um where do you think hillary clinton goes from here well it's hard i know people say uh there's what is it bernie mentum i don't know uh, whether there is something of momentum. I thought that, that as Guy Benson said uh, on Fox last night, that one of the lessons out of Iowa was that the laws of political gravity still work. Uh, and uh, showing that without an organization, you don't do as well as the people who do have an organization, like Cruz did. So I don't know where Bernie goes after New Hampshire, it certainly looks like it's he's going to win it going away there. Uh, I suppose there are some people in South Carolina. The the margin between New Hampshire and South Carolina is much shorter this time. It's only 11 days. It has been up to like 21 days sometimes. Um, so we'll see. I know in um, I, I know from past experience. I was working as uh, Laura Bush's press secretary in the New Hampshire primary in in 2000. And I came. To, I was at breakfast, and I Carl Rove was going through some papers, and I said, uh, "So, what does it look like?" Because it was the first, the first, uh, what do you call it? The first wave of of exit polls, <laughs> and he shook his head. And I said, oh, it's not good. He says it's worse than that. And uh, Bush was losing to McCain by 15 points at that point. Of course, it turned out to be even worse at 19 points because McCain did what Kasich and actually Chris Christie have done in New Hampshire, which is you go through it. It's tedious, um, but living room by living room, talking to seven or 11 people at a time, uh, going through who you are appearing to go through who you are and your plans and your programs and being available and and uh, you know, there were one uh, not apocryphal stories about people in New Hampshire who who take uh, I don't know some people might call it arrogant but who take their their role uh, as the first uh, primary state uh, very seriously saying, well, I don't know whether I can vote for him or not. I've only talked to him two or three times. Uh, and that's, that's the way it is. Uh, Trump, as he did in Iowa, has counted on big rallies and his celebrityness and, and, and free media. But I think this uh, puncturing of his inevitability balloon will give some others, uh, like Rubio, uh, a... Um, more time and Rubio had more time in that last debate last week and uh and he he hit it out of the park uh when he did that uh and uh, and Trump um, can you imagine if with another whatever it was 1900 votes if Rubio had come in second yeah that Trump would have been a meltdown and, that would have been bad for Trump that outcome would have been very bad for Trump i think and it almost was and if you look at the numbers oh, oh one percentage point isn't that big um, I'm not even sure it was a full the, percentage point. It was pretty close. It was very close, yeah. Uh, so um, I, I don't, you know, I I can't see Bernie going beyond 
New Hampshire and South Carolina, the black vote is supposed to be in Clinton's uh, pocketbook. I don't know whether, you know, I don't know this time. You can't, you can't make predictions, and that's, you know, that's why they're going to play the Super Bowl. It, it, it's uh, on paper, you, you wouldn't have to do some of these, but um, that's why, it's, that's why politics is so interesting, and it'll be interesting to see uh, how this stuff unfolds in a month at uh, at CPAC too. Well, it will be. It will be. By the, by the time CPAC rolls around, I think CPAC is right before the Super Tuesday, right? Because Super Tuesday, I think, is March Yeah, it's March, uh, it's March uh, 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Yeah, CPAC is March uh, March 3rd, 4th, and 5th. And I think uh, Super Tuesday is March 8th, right? Or is it March 15th? I think it's the 15th, but I could be wrong. Yeah, so March 15th. So it'll be right before then. Which means that basically everybody's still going to be in the race who um, makes it out of New Hampshire. And this is the other question, right? I mean, people were talking about, oh, it's a three-person race, it's a three-person race. Well, there's three more people in New Hampshire who are still competitive there. John Kasich, Jeb Bush, and Chris Christie. And yeah. the, the question is, is that who comes out in the top three in New Hampshire? Do any of those three guys actually penetrate? Cruz is not going to do as well in New Hampshire. He's not the kind of candidate that New Hampshire voters generally flock to. Rubio might. Um, and I think if Rubio does well, I think if, he's, if, he, if he has momentum coming out of Iowa, and it seems clear that he does, then I think you start seeing him picking up some momentum in New Hampshire, and that may be at the expense, not of Donald Trump so much, but of Jeb Bush, John Kasich, and Chris Christie. Yeah, yeah. And and, and, that, and that was sort of what his... the. The thrust of his remarks after the caucuses last night, and, and of course the argument from the campaign itself was that, you know, existing governors aren't going to get it done. You need somebody who's coming in from the outside. And, I mean, who's that aimed at? It's aimed at Jeb Bush, John Kasich, and Chris Christie. That's who it's aimed at. Is it, The yep. governors need to stand aside and, and let the and let the young Turks take this, take this over. Yeah, absolutely. It's... Uh... It'll be it'll be interesting. Um, uh, ben Carson seems to be uh, sliding out of the picture, and um, uh, and Carly Fiorina was down with Bush and Christie uh, and Kasich at two percent in Iowa. It, it looked coming out of Iowa like it was a three person race, uh, and I think New Hampshire will provide an opportunity for a fourth one to. Uh, to maybe enter the field, um, and then we'll see what happens in uh, in South Carolina, which isn't necessarily predictive either. South Carolina is where George W. Bush uh, knocked McCain basically out of the race. Uh, to, it's where, as you pointed out, Newt Gingrich won, uh, and then uh, Romney basically knocked him out of the race in Florida after that. Uh, so... Uh, it's uh, it's fascinating this time. I don't. Uh, I uh, it's a good thing I'm uh, I'm I don't uh, usually make predictions. <laughs> you know, I didn't last night either. Uh, All pundit did, which kind of surprised me because <laughs> I wasn't really expecting to to make a prediction. Um, but I think I would have predicted Trump winning last night if I had I made a prediction. I I knew that the top three. I mean, it was pretty obvious that the top three were going to be Trump, Cruz, and Rubio. The question would have been. What order? I never would have predicted Rubio in second place. I don't think I would have predicted he, that he would have come close. And so that you was said second. You mean third? No, I, I would have. I would have expected him to come in third. I would oh, not have okay. expected him to come in second. I didn't think he'd even get close to second. I thought if he came in five or six points below, um, you know, uh, the second place finisher, that that would be a pretty good night for him. Um, and as it turned out, it was a much better night than I thought. But, you know, South Carolina is, I think, really going to be the dividing line. I like South Carolina um, to, for that role for this reason. Trump is really not the kind of guy who should do well in South Carolina. I know he's got a lead there right now, but he's not the kind of candidate that South Carolinians usually go for. They are usually yeah. closer to Iowa voters and value voters and evangelicals and... Uh, movement conservatives do well in South Carolina. And I think it's, you know, Trump has had a lot of media exposure, and I think that's helping him in South Carolina. But seeing Cruz and Rubio bounce out of Iowa in the way that they do, if they hold up well in New Hampshire, 
I, I don't know that you're going to see a great deal of change in the New Hampshire race just because it's only seven days away. I think where you're going to start seeing this change is in South Carolina. And I think especially because Trump is not is not a good fit for the South Carolina Republican electorate, I'd say look at the South Carolina um, primary as the first thing that's going to change in this race. Yeah. Well, I know Cruz is uh, he's put a lot of resources in uh, kind of quietly in the southeast and across the south. Remember, he did that bus tour. And uh, he's been organizing uh, young people on campuses and spending a lot of time. Remember how he hung around Blog Bash at, at CPAC and, and uh, took selfies with anybody who wanted them and chatted with small groups of people long after you would expect our usual politician to leave uh, because he knew the power of them. Uh, uh, and, of course, they had helped him so much in... Um, in the, in his uh, Texas primary against uh, Dewhurst, so uh, it'll be. Um, I think I think Cruz may be stronger longer than a lot of people expect. Yeah, I think Cruz is. I, well, Cruz is built for it. He's built a campaign for it. So is Rubio. Yeah, uh, those are the two guys who I think are built for this. I think Trump. I think Trump actually proved that you can p- compete without building a ground organization if you have that celebrity name uh, identification and the ability to draw free media. The question now is, has that loss taken the edge off of his ability to draw free media? Will the media cover him the same way? Will they start being more critical of him in, in ways... They've been criticizing him all along, uh, but are they going to... I, I, maybe just not even cover him as much now that he's lost. I don't think, I think you're right. I don't think they will. Uh, and I think Rubio will get some more of it. You know, the, the guys on the, the other people on the debate panel have put up with Trump sucking all the oxygen out of the room. I think now Cruz and Rubio will be taking some more of the oxygen from, from Trump on the, in terms of, uh, media coverage. Uh, and, uh, that will help them. It'll help them with money, uh, certainly, but it will help them uh, with uh, with votes and appearing to be uh, realistic alternatives. I think uh, Rubio always has been. I mean, all fall, he has been the consistent winner when you ask uh, people, okay, well, you like X, but who's your second choice? And it's uh, overwhelmingly been Rubio. So, you know, he's been positioning himself not to peak early, to be ready to take advantage of it when um, when his opportunity came along, and uh, we'll see if he can do it now. I I went to Las Vegas last summer to Freedom Fest uh, specifically to see Rubio, and I got to say, uh, his, I don't know, 20 or 25-minute speech to libertarians uh, uh, was mid-general election form. Uh, he didn't have he didn't have notes. He didn't have a teleprompter, um, and clearly he was honing the same story that he did in much abbreviated form uh, in his uh, speech last night. Uh, but uh, boy, he was he was impressive. I I say that as somebody I want to win in November. <laughs> you know, I'm. I uh, yes, I would like someone to be as conservative as possible to win, and um, I think I think you have to be likable to do that. And uh, Rubio, with that constant smile and and uh, is always twisting things to the future, uh, and you know he's got plenty of criticism for. Um, uh, Clinton and Obama, but it's always couched as we know how bad they've done. You don't want that in the future, right. as as opposed to hand wringing over what's been going on. There's a lot of hand wringing over you know terrible leaders, inept leaders, terrible negotiators. They're just awful, with no real uh, suggestions as to how to fix it. And if you come along and acknowledge the problems that we've endured as a, as a society under others' leadership, but you use that as a springboard to how, what you would do, 
that's been a, the traditional form uh, of winning, and uh, yep. it'll be interesting to see who who gets uh, who gets that in the best shape uh, in the months ahead. But uh, I don't I don't think we're going to go into a brokered convention. I think there's going to be a resolution here. In the yeah, next, I think uh, if it gets done to a three person race, especially. It's easy to get to a to a nominee in in a three person race, and I, I agree with you. But you know what else I agree with you on? What's that? <laughs> the lightning round. I agree with you that we should have a lightning round. Yes, the lightning round where Andrew and I take your questions from the chat room and we respond with... Well, it's called Pithy. Well, as T. Rand will attest, it's never called Pithy with Andrew and I, but we, we try. We do try to be Pithy. That's what my mother always used to say. He's trying. Very trying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the... Uh, the first mate says that often about me too. So, <laughs> all right. So we take your questions. You put a Q uh, colon space in your question in the chat room. And, and Andrew and I will pick up on that and we will try to be, <clears throat> we will try to be pithy and we'll reach back here and pick up a question from Opachenga, which he just actually uh, read, uh, written, wrote up here. It says, will Trump now need an interview with Megan Kelly? To get back on track, uh, you know, I'm, I'm extrapolating here. Well, uh, it, it, it can't hurt. Uh, she certainly came across as, uh, I thought they were legitimate questions back in August. It didn't bother me at all. Um, but um, Yeah, it didn't bother me either. They were tough, but uh, they, were not, they were not unfair questions, given his history. Although I must admit that in the last, uh, the debate last week and, and last night, um, I was mesmerized by her eyelashes. I kept expecting them to fall off with a thud. Those those suckers were huge. <laughs> I, well, I don't know how she opened her eyes. Those things batting them around. But uh, I think she was uh, she was um, has been very good on the questioning. And then people who want to get some credibility ought to go up. Uh, well, I don't know if they go up against her, but they ought to go up and and submit themselves to her uh, her questioning. Well, I, I actually think that yeah, he might have to he might have to come back and do an interview with Megan Kelly to uh, sort of reset that part of his campaign because very clearly the whole Fox fight didn't work for him in in Iowa <laughs> and and I think it's it's I don't think it's a going to be an issue one way or the other in New Hampshire unless he keeps pressing his uh, unless he keeps pressing it but. Um, yeah, something well, like we'll that. See, we'll see. We'll see what uh, I think it's ABC that does the debate this Saturday. So we'll see what uh, George Stephanopoulos comes up with some abortion question like last time. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Exactly. Next question up from Nutrix. Welcome to the show, by the way, Nutrix. John Kerry sent email to Hillary from his personal email account. I haven't seen that story. Um, I would assume that we're talking about while she was Secretary of State and he was the. Um, chair of the senate foreign relations committee i'm i'm guessing anyway um that would be perhaps problematic if he's discussing classified information it would be very problematic but just the fact of sending emails back and forth on personal e on personal email accounts isn't necessarily an issue it's when you are discuss when you're doing it a to hide the communications from congress and the courts and b uh, you're revealing uh, classified uh, information in unsecured communication formats. That's the issue. Uh, I'd need to know more about what the emails were in Nutrix in order to in order to have a really good answer on that. But it's certainly interesting, Andrew. What you said? <laughs> that's pithy. <laughs> yeah, that's three words. That's a that should be a Malcolm record. The, that's the that's pithy. All right. Next question up: Does Andrew think Cruz would lose to Hillary? Isn't the rule yes. the most conservative that can win? Um, so you think Cruz would lose to Hillary? Oh, absolutely. Interesting. I don't. I think Cruz could beat Hillary. Yeah. Uh, he just, he's not, uh, uh, he needs to be warmer uh, and and nicer. That, um, that I mean, I, I look at the cosmetics, and individually, they don't matter. But going, uh, taking them together, I think they do matter. Uh, when when people watch somebody on television, they're not really listening to what they say. 
Yep. And if you need proof of that, take a look at the transcript of these debates. Uh, you think you hear hear them say something, and then you look at the transcript and you go, "Whoa, really? I, I don't, I don't remember that part." Uh, because people, uh, when they see with their eyes, they see what they want to see, and they hear what they want to hear. But when you read it, you don't have any choice. It's just the words right there. And uh, um, I think Cruz is, uh, you know, he can change, but I think he's too strident. Uh, he reminds me of, uh, and he's rightly proud of his conservatism, but uh, he doesn't lay it out there as the conservatism that everybody should embrace because it will benefit you. He lays it out there as the conservatism that is the right and the true way and you have to believe it, and 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 that's it's good. It's a good point. That's not uh, that's not the way to do it. When you're talking about people you oppose, and you want to head the Republican Party, and you're criticizing the Republican Party, I understand how that works. When you're a rogue senator, but when you're a want to be and potentially could be a party's official nominee. Um, you have to be likable, and when you see that little that little smile that he does, it's uh, I don't know it it, uh, it it probably well obviously it doesn't bother a lot of people, but um, uh, it it's kind of cheesy uh, when you see uh, Hillary uh, laugh. That's cheesy. Yes. Um, yeah. When you when when you see a Rubio smile. It seems very real and credible. Uh, you know, last week after the Fox debate, that Frank Lund's focus group, um, he asked how many people came in here supporting Rubio, and two or three raised their hand. They said, how many support Rubio now? And probably 90% of the people raised their hand. Yeah. Um, because when you see him, when you hear him, when you experience any candidate, but in this case Rubio, um, you have a visceral first impression reaction, right? And with with Rubio, it's optimistic, it's cheerful, it's friendly. He's got a thought, some thoughts that you may agree with or not agree with. Um, he's got a real problem with the real hardcore base over immigration, but I think that issue is going to fade. As he picks up some wins, picks up some, some some momentum, and we get a whole range of other issues in the field. Uh, I think that immigration and some of the other issues were really important in the fall when voting for someone was hypothetical. But after some people have voted for them, uh, and you see the results that an awful lot of people do like somebody, uh, then I think some of those issues uh, fade in what seemed to be their disqualifying import. Uh, and I hope they do, because uh, I think people need to be real about winning. I'm, I'm really, really serious about winning this time. We have to win. Um, we're going to have three or four Supreme Court justices, which will set the tone of the country uh, long after I'm gone, that's for sure. And... Right. Uh, uh, and will, in terms of fixing uh, what Obama and Harry Reid and Pelosi and others have done wrong, and in terms of taking us on a new, much more expansive economic pathway, uh, we really, really need to win this one. So, um, I agree. I just, I, agree. I just, I, I just think that Cruz, uh, he needs to mellow. Some, yes, he, he, he needs to become more likable. Um, and when you saw Rubio last night, he had his little boy with him, and he, while he's talking to somebody, he's tossing his kid's hair and patting him. And uh, Cruz, um, you know, his, his wife was there, and his father, and his mother, and his niece, and and uh, but you just there's just not the warmth there. And as someone who's interested in political packaging, and you could say it doesn't matter. It, it may not matter in what gets done politically, but it matters in who gets picked politically. Good point. All good points. All right, next question up. Uh, what are your thoughts? And this is from Sarjex, who's joining us. Yay, Sarjex. Great to have you back. Um, the audience is exploding. 
they they've probably heard about this new book. They have heard about this new book, Going Red. But we'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> Thoughts on Cruz winning Iowa without genuflecting before King Corn? Yeah, that was kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, that was. I thought that was courageous. Um, I don't know that I agree with him, but uh, it, it, that's he certainly took a stand and stuck with it. And you you might have expected him to trim his sails a little bit, and and he didn't. So that was uh, yeah, applaud it for that. Yeah, I think that the ethanol thing might be a little um, overplayed in Iowa. I'm not necessarily sure that Iowa farmers are, um, well, that Iowans, I should say, Iowa voters. Iowa farmers probably are really keen on it, but I, I don't know that all Iowa voters really think that that's the the big issue going into these elections. So I'm 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 with Andrew. I thought it was a courageous uh, stand to take, and I'm not actually that surprised that it turned out to be sort of a nothing um, in the campaign as it turned out. Of course, it's easy though. He only had to win 28 percent of the vote to win that thing. If it had been a two or three person race in reality. Yeah. That position might have been enough to keep That's him from winning. That's a very good point. Yeah, very you know, good. You can yeah. you can take those risks when there's twelve people in the field. You know, it's a it's a it's a little different. All right, next question up, also from Sarjex. How long before Jeb drops out? She calls him Yeb, but uh, how long before Jeb drops out? Uh, I would say it'll be a while. Um, he's got a he's got a bunch of money. Um, and uh, I, I think, I think uh, well, I said I don't get in the prediction business, but I don't, uh, I don't, I don't see him getting out uh, uh, before Florida. Well, I see, when does Nevada come? Is that Nevada is after South Carolina, right? Um, uh, yeah, it comes in right after South Carolina. I think. Let me go ahead. Uh, let me go ahead and pull up the schedule here because I'm always trying to remember exactly. Um, how that oh, um, I, th- I think I think Bush is in it uh, through South Carolina, and then we'll see. Well, I think South Carolina. Um, let's see. I think uh, this is this isn't telling me anything. Um, I, I'm always trying to remember exactly when these things are at. The South Carolina primary is on February 20th, so we're still like three week, well, two and a half weeks off from that. Um, and then you've got Nevada three days later, which is a uh, caucus system. And then you've got, oh, Super Tuesday is March 1st. So we'll actually, um, we'll actually be um, at CPAC when that is passed. So we'll be discussing it on that. Minnesota, by the way, is one of the states that is on Super Tuesday, but we're, we're caucuses and our caucuses actually do not um, uh, fix the um, delegates on the opening round. So it's like, it's like Iowa used to be. So, uh, yeah. okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, well, so- I just, I just wish that, that people, you know, you see on Twitter, uh, and I love Twitter, but you see on Twitter, be, Oh, why doesn't Bush get out? You know, and I feel like saying, why don't you just shut up, support your guy and, and let's stop, uh, shooting at uh, people on our side. Let the, they're the ones making the investment. And I tell you, it's an emotional and a physical investment that these candidates make. I, I would never call on anybody to get out of the race. It's, that's their call. They're the ones that are offering themselves up, and thank God they do, to make our democratic system work. I, I never would. Uh, I'm, surprised that there, I'm surprised that there's still as many as there are um, actively campaigning, though. I really am. I thought we'd be down to five or six by this point in time. And, well, they uh, only cast the first vote uh, yeah, but hours the, ago. Yeah, but usually the money runs out. You know, usually the money runs out. They don't have the they don't have the funds to continue. I mean, that's what happened on the Democratic side, right? I mean, Lincoln Chafee and Jim Webb. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I. <laughs> 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 I just wanted to see what you were going to say. Lincoln Chafee and Jim Webb, those two stalwart. Those two, uh, those two monoliths. Um, well, you know, we've lost the Jindal and Perry. Yeah, true. Uh, and, and there was somebody else. Lindsey uh, Graham. We lost Lindsey Graham. That Lindsey was a blow. Graham, yeah. Scott well, Walker. You know, I would put him in the Lincoln Chafee category. Uh, Scott his Walker. Role there, his role there was to talk about ISIS in Afghanistan, and I thought he did that. Pretty well. He did that rather well. Yeah. Uh, Bush, I thought, had his best debate ever last week. Uh, too late, in my opinion, but uh, he had a he had a really good uh, turn there, and it tells you, in a way, how much Trump was inside his head there uh, when 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 Trump is there. Uh, but um, 
you know, you can look at Kasich and you can go, no. But uh, you, you got to let the people uh, vote on this and talk about it. And I just, it just bothers me. As I said, I'm so into winning. Darn it. Just let's win that uh, when people start knocking other players on their own side you know we're we're in the locker room getting ready for the super bowl it's too late to start talking about i don't like the quarterback just shut up and let's go out on the field and uh, and play the game and whoever plays well will play the second half uh but you know you don't go along the sidelines going geez he's not doing very well and he's on your team so oh, there I don't you know. go that's a good but point. that's 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 just me i don't know i've been in the stands and baseball and football games and I, I've heard it I've heard it done differently but I, I your, your point is well taken <laughs> well yeah yeah you bought the ticket you ought to get to say what your opinion is that's, that's right for yeah, sure. that's true all right all right so we're almost out of time but we still have not heard the jokes of the week Andrew what yeah, are the jokes well, of the week Seth Myers Seth Myers says that the the burger chain White Castle is offering uh, dinner reservations for Valentine's Day this year and he says it's the perfect way to tell the person you love that you don't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. And, and um, uh, this is before the uh, before the the uh, caucuses. But Conan O'Brien said uh, the latest CBS poll has Bernie Sanders beating Hillary Clinton by one percent. Though another poll has Hillary Clinton beating Bernie Sanders with a folding chair. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, finally, uh, uh, Conan said uh, Hillary Clinton says that she feels great about her chances to be the Democratic nominee. And Bill Clinton said, Hillary, it's 3.30 in the morning. Go back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, speaking of hitting Bernie over the head with a uh, folding chair, uh, her her speech yesterday was a little angry, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, it was, and that gesturing. Uh, uh, and um, uh, my wife noticed uh, the, um, uh, you know, Bill got up and was introducing her and uh, was very generous and nobody's more qualified and so on and so forth. And then she got up and said, uh, whatever it was, 49 years. Really? Has it been that long? It <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, was not exactly magnanimous. So, um, no. But uh, that's the baggage that uh, everybody has come to expect with that crowd. Well, you know, Martin O'Malley, uh, we're almost out of time here. But, well, not really, but I mean, I won't keep you too much longer, but Martin O'Malley dropped out last night. Uh, as, yeah, how, do you, how do you tell? <laughs> how do you tell? You know how I can tell? Because the average age of the Democratic potential nominees yeah. went up by about 11 years. That's how I can tell. <laughs> That's right. Jeez, That's it went a up, very good It point. went up from like, what was it, like 60 to 71 <laughs> in one yeah. fell swoop. Yeah, exactly. That's a really good point. Well, you, you know, uh, not many people think about it, but uh, uh, Trump is a year older than Hillary. No, no, he's uh, like he, oh, Trump is. Yes, I'm sorry, but yeah, 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 yeah he's old. And uh, and uh, and Bush is 63, and those are the old folks on the Republican side. Rubio is the youngest by six months. He's 44 still until May, uh, and um, Cruz is 45, uh, and um, so the, the Republicans have a have a young a young field. Yes, they do. Uh, and and when you picture. Uh, one of them walking out on the stage uh, for the debate next fall or sitting there uh it'll be quite a contrast uh when you see uh, a young person and um, and Hillary and or Bernie or uh if she gets indicted an angry Elizabeth Warren or whomever yeah yeah, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting indeed. Andrew Malcolm, of course, at investors.com slash Andrew Malcolm. He is the prince of Twitter at A.H. Malcolm, and you should be following him if you're not. You're a loser, and you're not huge and elegant. <laughs> no, you're a huge loser. Huge and unelegant loser if you're not following Andrew Malcolm on Twitter. <laughs> Andrew, thanks so much for being with us today, sir. We will talk to you again next week. Okay, see you then. See you later. Andrew Malcolm has been my guest for this part of the Ed Morrissey Show. 
And coming up next, my conversation recorded earlier today with Representative Ron DeSantis, the chairman of the Subcommittee on National Security for House uh, Oversight and Government uh, Reform, uh, talking about Hillary Clinton and the emails. Here we go. Joining me on the show now is Representative Ron DeSantis, a Republican from Florida, the chairman of the Subcommittee for Oversight and Government Reform that deals with national security issues, and of course, just the person we want to have talking about the big issue uh, this week, which is the revelation that the State Department has to withhold 22 emails because even a redacted version of them would be too sensitive to release. Uh, Congressman DeSantis... For anybody who's ever worked in with classified material of any sort, this is very scary stuff. This is the type of thing that we all had to endure numerous <laughs> security briefings about repeatedly throughout the entirety of our um, of our uh, the lives of our clearances. Um, this is just uh, extraordinary, is it not? No, oh, absolutely. And the thing is. When you're talking about information of that level, it's actually hard to transmit it uh, via, say, an unsecured email server. Uh, well, for example, when I was in Iraq, you know, we were in a tent, a uh, big tent in Fallujah, but if you looked at the skiff that was where they did the signals, intelligence, and other things that would be classified at the top secret level, I mean, that was like a fortified mini little bunker there. And when you would go in, you'd have to sign in. You wouldn't be allowed to even you know, have, have your personal electronics. You couldn't be bringing things out. Um, and so to get something classified at that level on a private email would have taken um, uh, actual effort. And in fact, before before uh, coming on the show today, we had a classified hearing on the Judiciary Committee at the top secret level um, about some of the foreign surveillance authorities. And we got kicked out of the committee room. They swept the entire room for bugs. They confiscated all of our electronic devices. They informed us that, yes, we can take notes during the testimony, but those notes would have to be stored in a skiff, and you could not take those with you. And they even disconnected the timers for the witnesses at five minutes and the reason was is because those operate via Bluetooth and so that would not have been acceptable to discuss top secret information um, if you have Bluetooth activated and so you have all those things um, and yet you have a Secretary of State who thought it was fine to conduct all of her communications via her own homebrew server nobody who didn't have political connections would be able to get away with that in the military or in the intelligence services. Or, or in, I have to tell you this, in, in government contracting. Now, my experience with clearances is not terribly extensive, uh, Congressman. I, I worked on technical manuals for a defense contractor for three and a half years, which had uh, up to secret level. And then I was an FSO for another contractor that was basically there for just, I was doing security work. I wasn't doing, um, I wasn't handling materials at that point in time, but I had to be briefed on this stuff and I had to be cleared for it. Whatever the, whatever the clearance facility, the, the clearance for the facility was, I had to be cleared for that. So we had to do all the security briefings that I know from handling even the lower level classified information that it has to be stored in lock cabinets, at least in a facility that's designed to withstand uh, penetration. Uh, either electronically or physically in order to keep uh, uh, or both really in order to keep those uh, classified materials secure. I mean, there's, uh, there's sign out sheets. There's all sorts of things at the lower levels. I can only imagine what it would be like in a skiff uh, and dealing with top secret compartmented special access programs, which are some of the uh, issues that have arisen here. And we hear from Hillary Clinton that, uh, well, none of this stuff was marked classified. It wasn't classified when it went into my uh, when it went into my system. But I know enough about classified information to know that that's not the case. Things don't usually get classified classified retroactively, especially when we're dealing with intelligence and special access programs. Maybe you can explain a little bit of that. Well, uh, certain things are, are classified uh, as they are generated by their nature. So, for example. Uh, if you're talking about signals intelligence, targeting data, human intelligence sources, even if you were to get a document that, that was not, quote, marked classified, anyone who's been in the arena for 15 minutes would know that that is something that is very, very sensitive. And actually, I mean, if you look, um, some of these statutes don't even require them to actually be uh, actually classified if, if it's information that could harm the U.S. 793. You potentially have somebody who's culpable uh, for that. But But even that aside... It's not the markings, because under that view, 
that would mean that I can go and do a skiff. Uh, if somebody says something, then I can simply go back to my uh, office and put something in a private email. And I say, well, it wasn't marked classified. You know, I just got this information. You know, how am I supposed to know? That is absolutely not uh, the way. And in fact, lack of classification markings um, is not a defense. And I think that Hillary, it's going to be tough for her to um, argue if she had no other way she was receiving the information, she went out of her way to set up the rogue uh, email server, then what does she think about some of this stuff? I mean, you, of course you need information that's very, very sensitive and that is classified in a, in a situation like hers, and she did not. It doesn't appear that she ever had uh, a mechanism with which to uh, receive that other than her, her homebrew email account. So that is not going to fly um, I will. I did when uh, we had Jim Comey in front of the uh, Judiciary Committee a couple months ago. I specifically asked him that question. I said, "You, you do not, when you're investigating a case, simply because it wasn't marked. If there was classified information that was compromised, do you just shut down the investigation because it wasn't marked?" He actually wouldn't answer the question because he said, "Look, we're doing an ongoing investigation. Yeah. And it's sensitive. I, I don't want to. I don't want to discuss even the broad parameters." Um, of the law in that regard. And so, um, but actually, I, I thought that was fine because I think he is doing a good investigation. And um, at the end of the day, I think the American people just want Hillary to be treated like anybody else would under the law. And if she actually has uh, valid defenses to this and she's actually not guilty of compromising classified information, um, then put those out there. And the American people, I think, will, will understand. But I think the way it's going now, there's just a fear that even if Jim Comey does do a good investigation, you're turning it over to a very politicized Justice Department. And uh, whether you'll actually get justice done, uh, there's not a lot of hope, certainly for guys in my uh, position who've been through the Holder and now Lynch administrations. Absolutely. And this is the reason why yesterday you called for a special counsel to be assigned to this case that would be separate from uh, separate from the political considerations of the Department of Justice and, and the White House. Now, there's I mean, nobody really likes the special counsel law. I mean, it's usually there, there's there's a lot of baggage that comes with a special counsel law, but it does serve a purpose. And we've seen it used before in very similar circumstances in the Ver Valerie Plame case. Uh, George Bush demanded an investigation. Attorney General John Ashcroft, within, I think, just weeks of the leak becoming known, assigned the case to Patrick Fitzgerald uh, as special counsel for an independent investigation. And and it took quite a while for that investigation uh, to be completed, but they did. They assigned it to a special counsel. Um, tell us about your call for a special counsel uh, yesterday. On what basis are you making the, the, that call? Well, first of all, both Senator Cornyn and I circulated uh, a letter to the Department of Justice in the fall. I del hand delivered it to Loretta Lynch when she came to the Justice, uh, when she came before the Judiciary Committee, and they wrote us back like a cursory response. But they actually never even delivered it to, to my office or most of the signers. I think we had like 50 members who signed. We could only find one office where they actually hand delivered the response. They didn't provide it over email, so we were waiting for this over the Christmas holidays, and then we figure out that they actually delivered it to one sign or the letter only, so they're trying to, they're not really being on the level even about that response, but it was a cursory response, and so we wanted to write another letter to have them articulate why they don't think this is appropriate, and I would draw a distinction between the old independent counsel statute, which I think is constitutionally problematic because it created kind of a freestanding um, office within the executive branch that was not accountable to anybody versus using a special counsel in certain situations. And the two kind of wickets are either that there's a conflict of interest with the Department of Justice or uh, there are extraordinary circumstances. And, you know, we basically wrote a letter um, asking the Justice Department a series of questions about those two standards and why they think that one is not justified. I mean, for example, Loretta Lynch was appointed U.S. attorney in Brooklyn uh, by Bill Clinton in 1999. And, um, you know, maybe that doesn't mean she has an actual conflict of interest, but I think it would be good for the Justice Department to articulate uh, why they think that that's okay, that Lynch may make a decision about Bill Clinton's wife. I mean, as a line prosecutor, 
you know, if you're given a case and it concerns the family member of somebody that you have a relationship with, even on a professional level, usually they just assign that to another prosecutor. I mean, that's just the nature of it. Uh, so here's Lynch as the attorney general, and she has um, really rose to professional prominence because of Hillary's husband. So we'd like them to articulate, um, you know, why, why they think that, that it's okay for her to make a decision of potentially prosecuting Hillary. And then the, with the extraordinary circumstances, I mean, they make the point of how rare it is to assign a special counsel, and for good reason. But isn't this a a very extraordinary circumstance where you have a former cabinet secretary, and not just any cabinet secretary, the secretary of state, one of the most significant cabinet officials that we have in this country, who's now running for the Democratic presidential nomination, who seems to have the support of the uh, D.C. uh, and and establishment uh, elements of the Democratic Party, uh, and, and Obama's Justice Department is just going to do that as if it's just another case. I mean, I think most Americans will look at that and say, look, this is an extraordinary circumstance. Uh, And so the DOJ just providing us cursory answers saying, oh, well, this is rare. We're just going to continue doing it. You know, we don't think that's satisfactory. And there's a public, um, you know, justification here where a lot of Americans don't have confidence in the Justice Department at all to do equal justice under law. And if they're not going to do equal justice under law, we want to make sure we're putting them on the record and forcing them as best we can to answer questions so that the American people can fully see uh, that they're not doing this on the level. And it's a little odd with how this case is going. By all indications, it's not being really even done in conjunction with the Justice Department. I mean, normally if the FBI is investigating it, you know, they can open up a case by themselves. But as the investigation goes on, you're usually liaisoning with attorneys at the Department of Justice, and you're usually maybe uh, involved with grand jury proceedings or whatnot. As far as we can tell, none of that has happened. It's all just in uh, the FBI. And so I think what will end up happening is Comey will do an investigation and then put it on the desk of the Justice Department and say, you know, maybe he recommends prosecution, maybe he doesn't, and then they're going to take it. So it actually would be an easy thing to assign a special counsel, and then Comey would just bring the case to them. It's not as if the DOJ has really been intimately involved uh, with this investigation as it's been undertaken. You know, often we hear that um, congressional investigations of issues like this can be can conflict with um, open FBI investigations, open Department of Justice uh, investigations. And uh, obviously, this is a this is going to land in your lap in, in, in terms of congressional oversight, because you are the chair of the uh, Oversight and Government Reform Subcommittee on National Security. And I, this very clearly has national security implications. Um how how are you going to approach that uh, while there's while this FBI investigation is ongoing? Are you are you just keeping an eye on things and and waiting to see whether or not there's going to be some action taken and then preparing in case Congress needs to step into this? Well, um, I, I don't have carte blanche to 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 just do what I want. Exactly, I would be yeah. more aggressive than the than the Congress has been um, on this. But I think there are different tracks. I mean. The Department of Justice is looking to see whether there is conduct that is culpable under the criminal law that Hillary or and other for minions may have committed, um, and that's very very important. I think on our our, our end, um, you know, we have an interest in understanding the potential damage that was done to national security. Um, you know, I'd like to have, have experts come in and talk about if you're simply using a homebrew email server and you're communicating with all this stuff, you know, what are the odds or how easy what it would be for a foreign intelligence service uh, to crack that um, and to intercept the communications. I'd like to have someone discuss so that the American public is clear about, okay, how is it that you're supposed to handle this stuff? If it's not marked, does that mean you can send it? Or do you have to be in certain areas to receive it? Can you receive it on just an unclassified BlackBerry? And I think we could we could flush that out um, and then try to figure out what went wrong in the State Department. I mean, why was she able to do this? Because it's not just her. I mean, you have people sending her stuff on this uh, HDR email that she had, and usually that's something that, that you would think twice about because even if you're at the confidential or secret level, if I have if I'm on one of those systems, I physically would not be able to send an email to you if it's just a normal civilian, non-classified email. The the system just wouldn't do it. So when you're having that type of information being sent to Hillary's uh, private unsecured email address, 
uh, there's work that goes into that. And, you know, I'd like to know who was involved with that. How did this stuff end up getting into the email system to begin with? It's not something that just would have randomly showed up. Did the State Department actually, you know, create an exception so that people could send stuff directly to her? Were they having to put it uh, on an unclassed system and then send it? There are a lot of questions, but this is, these are the type of things that, you know, if you had some junior officer in, in the military, um, and you said, you know, m- you know, here's, you know, how some people are doing it. They would all say, no, you definitely can't do that. I mean, this is everybody knows that it's not even an issue. So how did it end up? Is it just because she was powerful and nobody wanted to say anything to her? Was it because her minions like Huma and some of the people around her wanted to protect her politically? I mean, I think those are important questions. But I think those are separate from whether there's going to be criminal culpability. And at the end of the day, I mean, we have the ability to issue subpoenas, conduct oversight, do some of those things. We don't have any authority as a legislative branch to initiate criminal prosecutions. And right. I get that question from people sometimes. You know, you guys have the Congress. Why don't you just, you know, why don't you you, you know, initiate a prosecution? And we can't. That's just no, not get, the way the separation of powers works. Absolutely true. Also, uh, the, the, the typical, if draconian... Um, uh, authority that Congress actually does have would be to impeach executive branch officials, but there's nobody left to impeach because the people who are involved in this are no longer in the executive branch. They're now civilians. Huma Abedin, uh, Jake Sullivan, Cheryl Mills, and of course Hillary Clinton no longer work for the government. And so, it again, there's only so much Congress can do. And I'm glad that you... I, I, I've had to m- make that explanation a couple of times as, as well, Congressman. I'm glad that you put but it back. I do think, though, example. you're right. I mean, uh, you know, I- impeachment is something that, that people instinctively think is, oh, you know, the president only, basically. And the founders put all civil officers under that. And yep. and I think it's a, it's a good check that needs to be used uh, for uh, kind of inferior executive branch officials short of the president because you know, the president's got a political base. And so even if there is something, unless his base abandons him, it's tough to get two-thirds to convict. But if you look at some people like Lois Lerner, you look at people in the State Department, they actually would be would be targets where that could be an effective check. Um, you know, we've tried, to, we've tried to initiate it with uh, John Koskin and the IRS. Up, yeah. um, that's pending in judiciary, and I don't know what's going to happen with that. Um, but I think think that apart from even the Hillary issue, um, I think that that would be a salutary check because if the bureaucracy knew that Congress was willing to use its authority, I think some people would behave better, and not just in terms of uh, classified info and being reckless, but you know when they intentionally go beyond statutes and expand their authority beyond what Congress uh, delegated, um, there needs to be some some pushback on that. And um, you know, sometimes that's the power of the purse, although we haven't been very effective at using that. Uh, but if there's an executive branch official that's definitely not uh, acting in accordance with the law or um, is not being honest with Congress, then it is a legitimate check. I just don't think in this case, as you said, they're all outside of the government now. So whether that would even apply, although it is true that the the main it's not impeachment is not really a punishment; it's a constitutional check. But the one punishment that does accrue to an individual who is convicted and removed from office is you can never hold office under the United under the authority of the United States again. And so some people who've mentioned that with Hillary say, "Oh well, she's running, so you need to prevent her." But I just don't know. It's never been done, and I think it would be very difficult to do. I think it would be very very difficult to do politically and and legally i think it would be extremely difficult to go down that road which is the reason why you're calling for a special counsel so that this can be taken up in a in an independent manner using what i think everybody has a lot of confidence in in james comey uh to conduct a um a a fair and impartial investigation of this uh but using that investigation to make the determination whether or not charges should be brought or a grand jury should be convened and i think you're I think that your call makes a tremendous amount of sense under the under the current circumstances, political and legal circumstances. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that that's uh, I think that that's right, and um, you know, it's the type of thing where if if Comey does a good investigation in terms of the politics of it that could potentially just take care of it either way, because if he's recommending prosecution and the Department of Justice is deep-sixing it, that's not a good place for Hillary to be politically either, because I think Americans are sick of people in Washington living under different rules. Um, And then, of course, if, if the Justice Department treats that case like any other, my sense is that they'll probably be enough. Let's just put it this way. If this was, if they were investigating Dinesh D'Souza for mishandling classified information, he would definitely get indicted, I can tell you that. Absolutely. I mean, if, the, if for me or anybody else on <laughs> on the on the on the lower levels of this, um, I, I would have been if doing what was done here 
if I was storing this information in my homebrew server at home without telling anybody about it, and it sat there for a year, um, I, I would be facing all sorts of charges. I, I have absolutely no doubt of that. And, and I can tell you that the United States government was extremely effective in communicating that to me repeatedly while I was working in that particular career, uh, Congressman. Um, they, were, they were not shy about reminding. Oh, it's a major, major thing. You're absolutely right. And the thing is, for Hillary, you know, when she gets, and oh, I didn't know it's classified. You know, if you go back to the very beginning, she deliberately made the choice to do the homebrew server yes. because she did not want to be subject to FOIA and congressional oversight. And she, she exactly. put her political interests and the ability to hide her conduct from the American people above the interests of the United States and our national security. So regardless of what the Justice Department says, to me, that disqualifies somebody who made that decision from being our next commander in chief. And, and quite frankly, the fact that the material was found on her server, which was it's A, sitting in her house, and then B, sitting in other unsecured um, facilities, uh, regardless of whether what the intent was, it's a flat out prima facie violation of U.S. Uh, 18 U.S. Uh, 1924. I mean, it, it, every single count, every single uh, piece of information that was sitting on there would be a separate count under 1924. You and I, you, you sort of alluded to this earlier, uh, but you know, 793. You can make the argument 1924. It's pretty obvious that there's a criminal violation going on here, and the question is whether or not there's the will to prosecute it. And, um, and I, I don't see how you can, I don't see how anybody can even argue that uh, violations of 1924 haven't occurred, Congressman, because that, that's the simple description of the, uh, of the, of the law in that, uh, in that sense. Yeah, look, I mean, she knew all this stuff was on her email. She knew she was conducting the business. She deliberately set up the server. I mean, you know, this is uh, something that if, if the Justice Department wanted to indict somebody, they have plenty that they can do. They have multiple statutes that they can pursue. Um, and so that's why if they, if they don't move forward when Comey brings the case, they're going to have to explain why. And uh, I just don't think they're going to be able to spin it in a way that satisfies the American people's sense of fairness because you can look at other people who have been prosecuted uh, for less egregious conduct. And that would be, I think, another area of congressional investigation if it got to that point. You know, you'll definitely see my committee calling up people um, who have been through this, and um, I think we'll be able to show that they were treated uh, differently than Hillary. Well, we're going to hopefully not have to get to that point because the Department of Justice will do the right thing uh, when uh, James Comey's investigation is over. But I want to thank you for uh, taking the time today, uh, Congressman DeSantis, for explaining all of these things in a very clear and concise manner. And uh, we're obviously going to be very interested in following the case and what um, – and what you have to say about it uh, in the next few months. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Take and we're back live here at the Ed Morrissey Show. Just a couple things. First off, um, I think it was um, Nutrix who was asking about the John Kerry message. I, I do want to actually address that now. I had a chance to take a look at that, and I'll have a post going up around 6 p.m. at uh, Hot Air on this topic. But apparently John Kerry used his own private email <laughs> system uh off of his ipad um and um the, the his email address has been redacted out of this thing but he sent um information that was classified secret at the time over his ipad about uh negotiations apparently between afghanistan and pakistan and uh meetings that he had been in on this, this is when he was uh, chair of the foreign relations committee in uh, May of 2011, the information has been redacted at the level of a secret, and its declassified date is May of 2036, which was 25 years to the day after the email was created, which tells you that it was classified at the moment it was sent. This actually appears to be classified by the Department of State. At least it's one of the agencies that is listed as the uh, classifying uh, agency. And here's another interesting data point. <clears throat> the um, the uh, letter was, or the email was copied to Tom Donilon, who was at the time Barack Obama's national security advisor, if I remember correctly, um, but certainly in the White House. And so you've got Tom Donilon and the White House looped in on this um, email, which is very, very interesting. 
uh, from a perspective of having uh, of an investigation. Why didn't Tom Donilon understand that this should have been classified and shouldn't have been on um, John Kerry's personal email or Hillary Clinton's personal email, for that matter? Uh, Tom Donilon's... Um, Tom Donilon's email address has been uh, redacted as well out of that, but presumably that was his uh, work email address because it has it listed as with his full name, Thomas E. Donilon. And so, yeah, all sorts of interesting things going on in the email scandal now. So it's uh, even more interesting now that we were talking about with uh, Representative DeSantis about the fact that Congress really can't take any action against Hillary Clinton because she's not in the government at the moment. There's really nothing they can do legally with her um, or uh, you know, they can't really sanction her in that in the sense that you could uh, somebody who's actually in the in the government. Uh, and then all of a sudden, John Kerry pops up on the radar screen. <laughs> this is uh, curiouser and curiouser. So, Nutrix, thank you for um, flagging that for me. And uh, I'm glad I got a chance to see it. But uh, that's that's my response right now. I'll have more on that coming up at Hot Air when we wrap things up here. In fact, I'll have to work on that almost immediately after Getting out. Well, other developments, of course, you all remember my book, Going Red, which comes out on April 12th. This is actually not the sale version of this. This is what's called a galley proof. And the galley proof is interesting. I'll, I'll hold this up here for you. It's basically a Xerox quality print of the book, just as exactly as it's laid out in the book that you'll buy, all of you, <laughs> in the bookstores. Um, but it's a Xerox quality print. Uh, and this is used for publicity purposes. We send these out to people who might be doing reviews, who might be interested in um, spreading a little buzz out there. So we're dealing with uh, mainly media figures, but also maybe a few think tanks and some of our allies in, in those areas and um, getting an idea of who might be interested in talking to me when the book is ready to come out or just before the book is ready to come out. This is what the cover is going to look like, but it'll look a little nicer in the hardbound version. You know, have a little bit more texturing and uh, it will it will be a little bit, um, uh, but it's pretty striking. I mean, it's a I think it's really striking. I really like this cover. So, um, I notice that it's got the Star Trek font. I don't know if uh, let's see if I, I I'll hold it up there, and uh, I, I'm sure that uh, Cranky T Rex will uh, will verify that that's sort of a it's not quite the Star Trek font, but it's kind of a Star Trekky kind of font. So I got logged out of the chat room. I just logged myself back in. So maybe Cranky T-Rex can, uh, can can comment on that. But that's going red. And uh, the um, update here is that the domain name is finally transferred to Penguin Random House. It took a while for reasons I don't want to get into. Um, just, you know, Murphy's Law type things that went on. Uh, but it's all set now. Uh, they have it. Uh, the, the website should be, uh, and I say should be, <laughs> Should be up and running by, uh, say, Friday, maybe, maybe over the weekend. Um, in which case, you'll be able to start getting links to all the different places where you can pre-order the book. So we're not just relying on an Amazon link, and I'll change the uh, show posts at that particular point in time. In fact, I'll probably sh change the show posts from today onward to just go ahead and show the domain name. And you'll see the, you know, coming soon from Penguin Random House um, page that they've got set up for it goingredbook.com uh, goingredbook.com yeah and Sarjax is saying that's not really the Star Trek font but it kind of reminds me um, <laughs> of the Star Trek font it just kind of reminds me a little bit of it so there you go maybe the older one um, am I going to interview myself when it comes out I can't think of anything more dull to do than to interview myself about my own book uh, that's, that is basically a monologue no, I'll, I'll, I'll be doing lots of interviews, though. Today, I've done a lot of interviews. I think I'm going to end up doing six interviews today. By the end of the day, you know, after the caucuses are over, um, a lot of people like to get um, folks on to talk about things. And actually, I'll be on from um, 6.30 to 7 Eastern time on uh, Relevant Radio with Sheila Logmina. So be sure to tune in if you get a chance. Uh, I haven't done anything on... Um, Sheila, Sheila's show in ages because every time we start thinking about doing it, I ended up already filling in for Drew and it didn't make any sense to just then turn around and do Sheila's show. 
But today we're going to do Sheila's show and it's going to be a lot of fun. So be sure to tune in on Relevant Radio. On Thursday, we're coming back with Dwayne Generalismo Patterson. I think we're going to get Eliana Johnson to talk about the, uh, the organization that went on in the Ted Cruz campaign in Iowa and what it might mean in New Hampshire and South Carolina. I mean, she's been um, tracking this and she had a really long explainer on this at National Review. Highly recommend you watch that or read that rather before you uh, see Eliana on the show on Thursday. Uh, looking forward to talking with her. She's stuck in Iowa as are a couple of my colleagues who might be coming up here. And if they do, they're going to be stuck here because the same blizzard that's going on in Iowa, unfortunately has hit here now. And uh, they're canceling lots of flights out of Minneapolis. So I uh, may have to, uh, may have to help out some of my stranded comrades up here. If that's the case, Eliana, of course, comes from here. She was originally from here. She's Scott Johnson's daughter uh, from Powerline. So if she makes it, her, if she makes her way up here, she'll have, it's like old home week to her. She knows how to handle it. So uh, we'll have to try to rescue our stranded uh, town hall comrades if, if, if need be. So uh, let's see. Um, all right. So that's coming up this week. Uh, anything else coming up this week? I don't think anything else unusual is coming up this week, but stay tuned. Uh, there may be more information as to what's going to go on with going red at CPAC. Uh, certainly that's going to start coming out. And I'm not sure, but I believe I'm doing, I'm, I'll, I'll be starting the audiobook, the recordings for the audiobook, either this, this weekend or next. And I still have to hear back on what the scoop is on that. And I'll, I'll be sure to get you an answer on that by Thursday, because I think you'll be interested in getting the, some of you will be interested in getting the audio book. All right. Until then, let's go ahead and wrap things up. I want to thank the folks in the chat room. Had a great chat room going today. You guys did a great job as always. It's a lot of fun having the chat room. Most fun part of the show is the chat room. If you're not actively participating in it, all you have to do is go to Ustream.tv and get a free, yes, that is free, login uh, from Ustream, uh, and then you can participate in all of the different chat rooms that they have at Ustream.tv, but specifically here on the Ed Morrissey Show, and you can ask me questions about going red when it comes out on uh, April 12th. I'll be flying around, and we'll probably be doing um, some remote shows with um, with Cranky T-Rex when possible, um, but but um, uh, we, may be, we may be doing a lot of shows with Cranky <laughs> over the next couple of months because of various different things. Um, Sarjak says that the font is called Revolution Gothic. Revolution Gothic. I like that. That's great. It just kind of reminded me of Star Trek. But thanks for checking that out, Sarjak. That's great. Um, all right, let's see. Who's been in the chat room? First off, let's uh, go ahead and play a little walking music here. I've got, a, I've got my soundboard hidden because I was looking at this email from John Kerry to um, Hillary Clinton that's rather amazing um all right here we go a little walking music coming up who's been in the chat room well we've got cranky t-rex cranky t-rex from uh cranky t-rex.blogspot.com he's also at buzzpo.com where he does a lot of writing he writes at hotair.com and you can find him on Twitter, at Cranky T-Rex. At Cranky T-Rex. He's great on Twitter. If you're not following him, you should be already. Sarjex, our artiste in residence, returns to us. And, you know, we miss her, but we know she's got a fabulous career going on. And so uh, we're, we're, that, that soothes our, our, our loneliness in your absence, Sarjex. But it's great to have you back. And, of course, I had to promote you right up, the, right up to... Uh, uh, troll gunner today just as soon as you showed up so thanks for keeping the chat room safe for democracy today Bob Knox conservative and liberal hands Fausta from Faustasblog.com a great western hemisphere blog I read it every single day so should you um, going red was actually the title of Fausta's um, autobiography of her tragic her tragic career as a matador um, going red that's not true is absolutely not true. Um, but you should read her ever, because what she writes is true. What I say about her is usually um, not. So there you go, except for the fact that she's got a great Western Hemisphere blog, and I read her every single day. Guelph, Juanito Cabron, Mr. Fastbucks, my sister's brother. Nutrix, welcome to the show, and thanks for the tip, Nutrix. Opachenga, Rick Two. Steve Egg from NoReadingEggs.com. 
Uh, I don't know if you're going to be in CPAC, Steve Egg, but I hope don't see you there. If not, I'll, I will catch up with you uh, when I'm in Milwaukee and Green Bay, probably Milwaukee, uh, on the book tour. So looking forward to that. T Rand, via Paso with the ancestral Mars events. Hi, Mom. By the way, Mom's got one of these coming. <laughs> she already knows it, but got one of these coming. Behind me, on keeping me on the straight and narrow, is the first mate. The first mate, who is almost done reading the book, actually. She's going to come out with a scathing review, I think. I think that's, I think that's her plan. <laughs> scathing, I say scathing. All right. Don't forget, we're going to be back on Thursday, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. Central, 1 on the left coast. Don't miss a minute of the Ed Morrissey Show and buy my book. See ya!